Our next speaker is uh, Professor Chang Jia Wee, uh, who will be speaking on a genealogy of tropical architecture, colonial networks, nature, and techno science. Um, just to give a bit of an introduction, Jia Hui uh, graduated with a PhD from University of California, Berkeley, is an associate professor in the Department of Architecture at the University of Singapore, a National University of Singapore. He is the author of A Genealogy of Tropical Architecture, Colonial Networks, Nature, and Technoscience, uh, published in 2016. And I, as I understand it, you, you also brought a few copies of the book, if any one of you are interested in uh, the topic that he's actually going to present to us today. And he was also a co-editor with William S. Lim, uh, S. W. Lim of Nun uh, West Modernist Past, 2011, and with Imran Tajuddin on Southeast Asia's Modern Architecture, Questions in Translation, Epistemology, and Power, which is due to be published this year, in 2018. His main current of uh, research, his main research interest now is on a history of air conditioning, built environment, and thermal governance in urban Asia, part of which is being undertaken as a, as a Canadian Centre for Architecture Mellon Foundation researcher uh, from 2017 to 2019. Besides that, Jat Wee is also working on an expansive history of modern architecture in Singapore and transnational histories of colonial architecture and urbanism in Asia. Jat Wee is also an editorial board member of Architectural Histories and the Singapore Architect. Uh, may I have you on stage? Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, good afternoon. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Ilhan Gallery, um, Simon, uh, Rahel, and uh, Chitu, and, and various other guys for organizing this and for um, inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. The title of my talk is also the title of my book. The book started off as a project of self-inventory. The inventory that I'm making is about the histories that have directly or indirectly influenced my architecture education in the 1990s, an education in which discourses of tropical architecture play a central part. My first encounter with tropical architecture is captured in the photograph on the screen that shows two awkward bodies, including that of mine, in a Balinese gazebo. This photograph was taken in 1993, during my first year field trip to Bali. My lecturer then wanted us to experience tropical living, so he arranged for us to visit tropical resorts in Bali. Implicit in this emphasis on tropical living was a criticism of the air-conditioned lives we led and are still leading in Singapore. However, our experience of tropical living in Bali was only partial, as we could not afford to stay in the exclusive tropical resorts, so we spent our nights in the air-conditioned rooms of a budget hotel instead. Upon returning from Bali, we were tasked to design a tropical house for our final project in our overly cool air-conditioned studio. Behind the pedagogy that emphasized tropical living was a body of architectural discourses and practices that emerged in Singapore and Malaysia during the 1980s and 90s. This included attempts by Te King Soon and Ken Yang to create an architectural language, to create new architectural language and urban typologies better suited to the tropics. They also included works by architects such as Jimmy Lim that draw on Southeast Asian vernacular traditions to produce beautifully crafted new vernacular houses and resorts. They were not just environmental discourses, they were also cultural discourses closely connected to the post-colonial identity politics that revolved around the activities of Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Subsequently, the discourses of tropicality in the built environment proliferated. By the mid-1990s, the different discourses and the attendant works of tropical architecture tended to be grouped under the very loose label of Asian tropical style or one of its interchangeable variants, and celebrated in pictorial books and lifestyle magazines, cover of which you see on the screen. Asian tropical style was a vague label used in a loose manner. Tropical architecture had by then become this taken for granted and seldom interrogated entity, nebulously associated with an array of keywords like climate, culture, and more recently, sustainability. A minor controversy that erupted in 2001 exposed the fissures within the discourses of tropical architecture. That year, Singapore Architect, a local architecture journal, published the outcome of a student workshop titled Neotropicality. 
The workshop was conducted by Chan Soo Kian, a Pinan born US educated Singapore based architect at the National University of Singapore. Tae King Soon, an eminent local architect, was disturbed by the way Chan framed the design exercise at the workshop, particularly Chan's extolling of the architectural aesthetic of interlocking rectilinear cubic forms. In Tae's mind, aesthetic was inseparable from cultural politics. For many years, he has been advocating an architectural aesthetic of line, age, and shade for the tropics to challenge what he saw as the Western slash colonial hegemonic aesthetic of volume, plane, and line. Tay was thus upset that despite its derivative origin in Western temperate form, Chan turned this aesthetic of volume and plane as neotropicality. Writing to the journal, Tay lamented how tropicality has degenerated from being part of the context of freeing oneself from the political and taste details of our colonial masters during the 1960s, during the era of decolonization, to a more of a fashion statement in the 2000s. He accused Chan's neotropicality of deferring and deflecting the quest for an, for an aesthetic of tropicality in our term and none other. Although this was a local controversy, I think it reflects some of the broader issues in the discourses of tropical architecture. Firstly, in Tay's association of the architecture aesthetics of tropicality with decolonization and independence from Western slash colonial hegemony, it's evident that tropical architecture was inextricably bound up with colonial and post-colonial power relations. In other words, despite the appeal to tropical nature, tropical architecture is political true and true. Secondly, in contrasting mid-20th century tropical architecture as a search for emancipatory architecture aesthetic with tropical architecture as a fashion statement subsequently, pandering to the taste of the West at the turn of the 21st century, we see that tropical architecture is not an unchanging construct derived from timeless nature, but a shifting context-dependent concept shaped by historical forces. Day's claim about the emancipatory politics behind mid-20th century tropical architecture is, however, not unproblematic. Many of you might know about the forms of colonial tropical architecture constructed, both materially and discursively, by the British and other European colonial powers in their tropical territories during the mid-20th century. This colonial tropical architecture also extended into the post-colonial era and involved North American and other European architects building in Asia Africa and Latin America as part of the mid-20th century international development aid to countries in the tropics. In other words, Western forms of tropical architecture was ubiquitous in the mid-20th century. As was documented in the contemporary publications by Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, Udo Katermant, York Lipsmeyer, and others. Um, cover of these books are on the screen. Given that Tay's aesthetic of line, age, and shape could be discerned in this colonial and neo-colonial tropical architecture, how then could the quest for an aesthetic of tropicality in the 1950s be an emancipatory form of politics, as Tay has claimed? In pointing out the existence of, tropical, of colonial tropical architecture, my intention is not to criticize Tay's position. Rather, my purpose is to argue that we need to understand the controversy involving Tay and Chan in the longer history of tropical architecture and its complex entanglements with colonial globalization before and during the mid-20th century. The earlier forms of tropical architecture might not be named as such, but like mid-20th century tropical architecture, they privilege tropical nature, particularly the hot and humid climate, as the prime determinant of architectural form. In fact, these earlier forms of tropical architecture established the foundation and formed the basis upon which institutionalized tropical architecture was built. The project of historicizing tropical arch architecture both before and during its institutionalization in the mid-20th century is what the book is about. It does that through six chapters in two parts. Um, because the book is too long, um, in this talk, I can only um, talk briefly about three of these chapters. And these um, chapters um, explore three moments in the genealogy of tropical architecture in the British Empire. They are the chapters highlighted in yellow. I, I know it's yellow and orangey, so it's not too clear. But it's chapter one, two, and five. Yep. Before I do that, we need to confront the taxonomic peculiarity of tropical architecture. Implying any construction of tropical architecture is, a, is this unspoken opposite, temperate architecture. But temperate architecture as a category does not exist 
Architecture in the temperate world was and still is categorized according to either smaller geographic unit based on nations or region, such as English, French, and Flemish, or styles such as classical, baroque, or modern. In other words, unlike the privileging of nature as the prime determinant for architecture in the tropical world, culture, be it national, regional culture, or culture in connection with aesthetic classification, was implicitly assumed to be the more significant factor in shaping the architecture of the temperate world. This taxonomic peculiarity implies that since tropical architecture is determined by an external and seemingly immutable nature, it is a homogeneous and static entity, whereas temperate architecture is heterogeneous and dynamic because it's shaped by evolving cultural forces. In, shape, in historicizing tropical architecture, I seek to understand this taxonomic peculiarity. I ask why and how nature was and still is privileged, and what did the privileging of nature achieve or facilitate? I argue that the privileging of nature led to an emphasis on techno-scientific solutions that obfuscated the underlying social, cultural, and political questions revolving around colonial and post-colonial power relations. So let us start with the first, historic, uh, first historical moment and also the first building type, the bungalow. By the early 19th century, after around two centuries of colonial rule over territories in the tropics, the British had established ways of building and living adapted to the social environmental conditions of the tropics. One of the most prevalent and established building types in the British colonial British tropical colonies at that time was probably the Anglo-Indian bungalow, which subsequently further circulated to other parts of Asia, Africa, and the rest of the world, as Anthony King's seminal book um, titled The Bungalow um, shows. The word bungalow was derived from bangalow, the Bengali word for peasant's heart of rural Bengal. As its name suggests, the bungalow is a hybrid typology which came about because the British adopted indigenous building forms, knowledge and practices, and adapted European building norms to them. The indigenization and acclimatization of the European built environment are also evident in the 19th century Hindi names for the various parts and climatic control devices um, of the bungalow in India, such as the zinc mill or chick, and the punkha as shown on the screen in the image on the top right. The indigenization and hybridization of the built environment was part of the broader pattern of how the British in India also adopted indigenous diets and lifestyles prior to the 19th century. The Anglo-Indian and later Anglo-Asian bungalows were lofty and airy houses, characterized by rooms with high ceiling and large doors that open into broad verandas enveloping the house. They seem to be planned and designed primarily with comfort in mind. At this moment of history, the tropics was not yet pathologized and seen as unhealthy to the Europeans. The tropics was only deemed as uncomfortable because of its heat and humidity. The British was thus primarily preoccupied with planning and designing comfortable buildings. In the 18th century and earlier, comfort was understood broadly as, a, as physical comfort in all its bodily senses. According to historian John Crawley, Physical comfort in terms of self-conscious satisfaction between the relationship, with the relationship between one's body and its immediate environment was an Anglo-American invention in the 18th century, and it led to veritable improvement in the material culture of the domestic environment. The airy and comfortable Anglo-Asian bungalow could be understood in this historical context. Physical comfort of the European inhabitants was not just provided through material culture of the built environment, it was also augmented by the relationship between architecture and landscape. Many of the Anglo-Asian bungalows were carefully sited in the tropical landscape, not only for the environmental benefit of breezes and shading. They were also strategically placed in relation to both the wild and manicured tropical landscape to create picturesque effects. In architecture history scholarship, hybridization tends to be seen as cultural processes that destabilize colonial binaries and question diffusionist narrative. However, hybridization could also be seen in relation to social technical processes of designing and building in the context of heteronomous and heterogeneous conditions of colonial architectural production. I know they are quite a mouthful, but let me explain. By heteronomous, I'm drawing from sociologist Magali Larson's notion of architectural heteronomy, 
Larson argues that instead of disciplinary and professional autonomy, heteronomy better describes architecture knowledge and practices as architects depend on external factors and other actors to build a building or to realize architecture. But heterogeneous, I'm drawing on what science technology scholar John Law calls heterogeneous engineering to describe the necessity of a stable artifact such as a building to have diverse elements aligned in a contingent assembly. The fragile contingency of the built environment might sound counterintuitive, especially to architects, given that building tends to convey an image of permanence and stability. But if we turn our attention to the colonial built environment, the tenuous nature of the building assembly become evident through the various forms and degrees of building failures, building that collapsed, building that didn't really work, which were really not uncommon at all in the, in the 19th century. As the, as, as the British Indian cartoon from the 19th century on the screen actually suggests. These failures could be par partially attributed to the heavy dependencies on local builders who spoke different languages and had dissimilar building cultures and craft traditions from the Europeans. Although cultural bias and the colonial tropes of representing the natives led many colonial architects and engineers to portray the local builders in negative stereotypes, variously as unskilled, callous, and unreliable workers. They also sought to learn their languages and practices to better understand and communicate with the builders in order to ensure better building outcome. The Europeans' lack of familiarity with the building resources available in the tropical colonies in the early phase of colonization might also account for the building failures. Each locality has its own types of timber, stones, bricks, and plaster, depending on both lo na local natural resources and building traditions. In addition, certain building tools and particularly mechanical appliances commonly available in industrializing Europe might not be found in the tropics. These building challenges have been overcome through various means, such as finding suitable local substitute and simplifying architectural design to match local building resources. Taken together, colonial hybridization should be seen through the social technical framework in relation to the various forms of improvisation, modification, on-the-job learning, and other strategies deployed by colonial builders to cope with the heteronormous and heterogeneous conditions of colonial architectural production. Hybridization should also be understood in relation to the colonial builder. Prior to the late 19th century, there were hardly any professional architects in British tropical colonies. Until the introduction of a systematic training in building construction for military engineers around the mid-19th century, as we shall see, the military engineer was not a figure formally trained to design and build. Next, let us move to the second historical moment in the mid-19th century um, to the early 20th century and look at another building type, the British colonial military barracks. Please allow me to introduce the key conceptual ideas associated with the colonial military barracks with a very brief overview of military barracks in Singapore historically. The first purpose-built military barrack in colonial Singapore were the Tangling Barracks, completed in 1862. As timber buildings with raised floors surrounded by verandas and covered by thatched roofs, they appear to be planned based on metropolitan standards but built with local materials. In the 1880s, a new military plan was devised for Singapore as its importance as a colonial port grew. Part of the plan entailed the erection of new military cantonments and barracks at the island of Pulau Brani and Blakang Mati. The barracks were two-story of half-brick, half-timber construction that combined specification based on metropolitan norms and standards spelled out in barrack synopsis, something that I'll explain later, with local colonial customs in, in building construction. In this case, local norms occasionally took precedent and overrode metropolitan standards. During the interwar years of 1920s and 30s, as part of uh, a plan of turning Singapore into a major British imperial defensive bulwark in the Far East, Changi Cantonment was planned and built by royal engineers. The typical barrack there was a three-story building in reinforced concrete. It adhered, not, it, had, it adhered to the type plans and planning standards prescribed in the latest barrack synopsis, both of, which were then, both, of, both of which were by then sufficiently flexible to accommodate local variations and adaptations. For example, the reinforced concrete frame of the barracks were, were calculated and designed in London, but a few of the different infill, opening, and roof systems were tested locally and implemented. We can discern in this brief overview that the military barrack became increasingly mobile and stable with time. 
While the earlier military barracks were not unlike the hybridized bungalow discussed in the first moment, in that they were transformed by local resources and labor when they circulated from one side to another, the later military barrack, especially its most recent iteration in Changi, was a re relative immutable type that remained relative sta relatively stable when it circulated. It was more stable because the military barrack in the tropics was a well-defined building type by the early 20th century, with clear space standards and spatial configuration prescribed by barrack synopsis and type plan respectively. Not only did the military barrack become more permanent in terms of construction material use, it also became less subjected to the vagaries of improvisation in response to the heteronomous and heterogeneous conditions of colonial architectural production. The increased stability was due to the more sophisticated definition of metropolitan standards, which could accommodate and even incorporate some extent of local changes and variations. In discussing the military barracks in this historical moment and contrasting them with the bungalows in the previous moment, I'm interested to explore how this increased stability and mobility came about and the underlying politics. The military barrack became more stable and mobile mainly because of the early to mid 19th century emergence of systematic knowledge of building in the tropics, which could be attributed to a number of factors. The first is systematic training of British military engineers from the early 19th century. Military engineers in Britain were the earliest to be formally schooled in building construction. In Britain and its empire, the establishment of a course in practical architecture at the Royal Engineers Establishment at Chatham in 1825 by Captain Charles Paisley was an important milestone. In the following year, Paisley published an influential textbook based on the course. The course and the textbook were designed to help military engineers sent to the colonies as builders by methodically covering the fundamentals in building construction. Besides formal training, Paisley and his colleague also pioneered systematic research into different aspects of building, including establishing an experimental tradition of testing building materials and comparing construction methods in Britain's tropical colonies. It was under such conditions of experimentation that one of the earliest standardized barracks for the tropics was produced in the West Indies. It was proposed in 1824 by Colonel Charles Smith, the commanding royal engineers of the West Indies, Designed to, cope with the ex designed to cope with extreme heat and moisture and mesmatic marshes, the proposed barrack was a freestanding two-story long and narrow building elevated on a half-story ventilated basement. The cross-section of the design shows that the, the barrack room in the middle is shielded from the sun and rain on both sides by veranda. The interior of the barrack room was spacious, providing large volume of air space per soldier. The design was informed by mathematic theory of disease transmission, which was the prevailing medical explanation for ill health. According to the theory, ill health was caused by poisonous miasma, a type of nauseous vapor from rotting organic matters associated with, associated with both the environment and human bodies. It was reasoned that the hot and humid climate in the tropics would hasten putrefaction, leading to the emission of more poisonous miasma. Likewise, large amount of miasma would also purportedly accumulate in overcrowded and ill-ventilated interior. The main remedies were to dilute the miasma through ventilation and having large amount of air space per inhabitant of a room. That means to reduce um, overcrowding and congestion. Therefore, Smith's proposed barrack had a narrow section and spacious interior with large openings that allowed the interior spaces to be well ventilated. Equally, if not more significantly, Smith proposed barrack was conceived as a con as a constructional system. Sorry, it should be this slide. As a constructional system that could be consistently replicated across different sites in the West Indies. The proposed barrack consisted of many cast iron components that could be prefabricated in a foundry in Britain and shipped to the West Indies to be example. The connections between the cast iron components were specially designed to facilitate easy assembly. By using an easy to example prefabricated system, Smith was able to build many barracks at different parts of the West Indies, despite a shortage of military engineers under his command and the lack of skilled building tradesmen in the region. Despite the important innovation and successes of Smith's system, the tropical barrack will only became further systematized and more widespread in the empire after the mid 19th century major sanitary reform in the British Army. Two momentous events took place. Two momentous events took place in the mid-19th century that led to a major sanitary reform. 
The first event was the Crimea War sanitary crisis that was famously exposed by Florence Nightingale. It led to the appointment of a Royal Commission on the Health of the Army in 1857 that statistically revealed the high mortality rates in the British Army and attributed them to the dark, damp, overcrowded and ill-ventilated barracks that the soldiers live in. The second was the 1857 to 8 Indian Rebellion and the political reform in the aftermath. The reform necessitated the stationing of a greater number of British soldiers in India. That focused the, the, the administrator's attention on the health of these soldiers in India and the sanitary conditions of their station. And that led to the appointment of a Royal Commission of the Sanitary State of the Army in India, which reviewed even higher mortality rates and more appalling living conditions than those in other stations. As insanitary, climates would, as, as insanitary barracks were deemed as the main causes for the bad health of the, of the British soldiers, the finding of both royal commissions led to the formations of barrack and hospital improvement commissions. A lot of commissions here. So this one is BHIC, Barrack and Hospital Improvement Commission, to examine the, ex the existing military barrack and hospital and devise means of improving them. Three different BHICs, one for home, Mediterranean, and Indian stations were formed because it was widely assumed that there was some kind of causal relationship between climate and health. The home station, those in Britain, uh, represented temperate climates and they were regarded as the healthiest for the British. The Indian station took, stood in for the tropical climate that was assumed to be, I quote, hostile to human life and to be especially deadly to the English race, end quote. While the Mediterranean stations occupy an intermediate position between these two extremes. The causal relationship between climate and health, or specifically hot climate and ill health, was obviously influenced by the mathematic theory of disease transmission discussed earlier. It was also shaped by the development of meteorology in the 19th century. Before then, climate was largely unquantified and unquantifiable. The availability of precise measuring instruments and the regularization of measuring methods in the early 19th century contributed to the quantification of climate and new modes of representing climatic data in space. By imposing order on seemingly chaotic data, new interpretation on utilities could emerge. One of those new interpretations was the reconstruction of the tropics from merely an uncomfortable other that we saw in the earlier moment to the tropics as a pathological other in this moment. All three BHICs uh, were primarily concerned with identifying a basic plan based on fundamental principles recognized as absolutely necessary for health for the stations they investigated. But given that the three commissions were distinguished by climatic differences predicated on the same miasmatic theory, it was not surprising that their reports issued between 1861 and 63 proposed model barracks that were based on the same basic configuration a symmetrical freestanding and one room deep barrack block with a staircase in the center and lavatories at the two end. The only differences between the model barracks of the three reports, all of which were uh, on the screen, were space standards in terms of floor area and volumetric space per soldier and whether they were verandas. The space standards and the logic of climatic variation subsequently became the basis of a definitive standard of military accommodation that was codified into different editions of barrack synopsis starting from 1865. In the barrack synopsis, a standardized list of buildings in, different, in the different types of military units in the British Empire was provided, and the floor areas and cubic spaces of the rooms laid down to guide the designs for any new bu barrack building. Since the barrack synopsis was continuously revised, up until um, the eve of Second World War, both the climatic classification and the space standard prescribed change. However, the climatic classification was still loosely based on the original schema of home, Mediterranean, and Indian stations. On a scale from the temperate to the tropics, with space standard becoming more generous as they move from the cold to the hot. So let me see, oops. I'm not sure where the, the laser pointer is. Um, but um, if you look at the, the graph, they all move from home stations to station aboard, but the scale A will be for subtropical, scale B will be for tropical. And then if you correspondingly look across the row, you will see that uh, the space standard become bigger and bigger. So as, as the station goes from um, temperate to the tropics, um, they have loftier ceilings and then they have larger um, um, per units um, floor area per soldier. 
So that, that is the same across different editions of Barrack Synopsis. The model barracks designed with the health of the soldiers in mind were located in cantonments. These were special environments, atypical of the general colonial landscape. For example, the Changi cantonment had a vast array of recreational amenities for the soldiers to use, and the buildings were carefully planned in the natural setting that was regarded by its residents as paradisical. The word cantonment derives from the French term cantonnaire, which, which means to quarter, divide, or separate. Implicit in the planning of any cantonment was what Anthony King calls the separation concept. Thus, not only was the cantonment an exceptional enclave, it was also conceived as a separate entity from the native city, near enough to defend it, but far enough not to be contaminated by its allegedly insanitary and even immoral conditions. This is also evident in the case of Changi, where, where an isolated and undeveloped site far away from the city was deliberately chosen for its construction. So uh, in, the, in the map on the top, um, Changi is that orange circle, which is very far from downtown Singapore, which is in the middle uh, of the island, south, um, south, southern middle part of the island. Many of the ideas regarding the siting and planning of cantonments in India and the tropics based on the separation concept were introduced in the aforementioned 1863 report of the Royal Commission. Besides separation, the report also recommended that new facilities such as garden, gymnasia, libraries, and reading rooms be introduced in the cantonments to encourage soldiers to spend their time productively in physical and moral improvements. It was made in response to the observation that idleness or the want of occupation among soldiers was a major cause of widespread intemperance, ill health, and even venereal diseases. Michel Foucault understands such an intervention into the milieu as a form of biopolitics, a regime of governance that sought to invest biopower in order to administer, multiply, and optimize the biological life of the population. Contrasting this new biopower with old sovereign power, he famously notes that while sovereign power is about the right to take life and let live, biopower is about the power to make live and let die. That means one is to kill, one is to extend and optimize life. The cantonment was, however, never truly separate or separable from the native city. Instead, it has a para paradisic, uh, parasitic social economic relationship with the. Sorry, it should be this slide. Yeah, it has a parasitic social economic relationship with the native city. Not only did the British soldiers in the colonies rely on an array of local servants to perform various household tasks and support their daily lives, the construction of the cantonment depended on military contribution from the colony and exceptions being made biopolitically to the lives of the colonized. For example, the Malayan colonial government made large military contributions for building the Imperial Naval Base and other defense infrastructure in Singapore, including the Changi Cantonment from the 1920s to the 1940s. The military contributions came from the colony's revenue, and in colonial Malaya, a significant proportion of that was derived from the tainted source of opium. This parasitic relationship between the cantonment and the native city was overlaid with an asymmetrical relationship contrasting the good lives of the soldiers and the sheer lives of the migrant laborers. It was also reflected spatially in the contrast between the spacious ground large greenery and good sanitary infrastructure of the cantonment that the colonial government invested in and the congested and insanitary native city that the colonial government willfully neglected. Now let us move to the third and final historical moment in the mid 20th century. At this historical juncture, um, so earlier two chapters covers um, building types. Now we move to slightly different um, building knowledge, especially building research. So it, it might read slightly abruptly, but it's, it's part of the overall thing of um, covering both building types and also the kind of underlying knowledge. So at this historical juncture, tropical architecture was institutionalized as a body of knowledge and practices widely applicable to all building types. So it's not just um, innovations are not just confined to any particular building types, but uh, widely applicable. Central to mid 20th century modern tropical architecture was techno-scientific knowledge and practices. They distinguished tropical architecture in this moment from its predecessor. The mid 20th century witnessed the establishment of numerous building research stations around the world that focused on tropical building problems. In 1950, even the United Nations reported on the growing emphasis on scientific research and experimentation aimed at improving building methods and design in the tropics. When the United Nations Tropical Housing Mission was dispatched to South and Southeast Asia 
between 1950 and 1951, it found a great amount of research, experimentation, and small-scale demonstration going on in South and Southeast Asia. The centrality of techno-scientific research was also evident in the numerous technical conferences and, spe and specialized meetings held to explore the challenges of building in the tropics during the 1950s. Furthermore, the many technical textbooks and manuals on tropical architecture and the new techno-scientific concepts and data and novel modes of representation further reinforced the impression of this techno-scientific turn. The earliest bu building research organization um, in the world was actually was the Building Research Station in Britain. Founded in 19 1921, it was the model for many state-funded building research organizations that were subsequently set up around the world. Building Research Station was, however, originally established to deal with only housing and other building problems in, in Britain. It was not until 1948 when a colonial liaison unit was established that it started to deal with building problems in the tropics. It was later expanded and renamed as the Tropical Building Division, clearly signaling its research focus. The Tropical Building Division of the Building Research Station has its origin in the recommendation put forward by the Colonial Housing Research Group in 1945. The group made two recommendations to coordinate the research on housing done at different parts of the British Empire. Firstly, the group recommended the establishment of a metropolitan centre, which it called the Colonial Housing Bureau, for the collection and dissemination of information concerning colonial housing research. It would be a depository in which information on housing research from different places could be organised and made available for consultation. Secondly, the group recommended setting up four regional research centres in the periphery, periphery of the empire that is, with the West Indies, East Asia, West Africa and Malaya being the proposed location. These recommendations represent the first time that a major coordinated effort with requisite financial backing was initiated by the colonial office to, to deal with the newly discovered problem of colonial housing. This quote-unquote discovery came about partly because of the policy changes following the passing of the 1940 Colonial Development and Welfare Act. Subsidies were made available to the colonies for, for social welfare provision in areas such as health, education and housing. The concern for the welfare of the natives, however, arise not from the benevolence of the British imperial government. Rather, it was part of a larger strategy to deal with what the British regarded as disturbances in the colony both labour unrest and anti-colonial nationalist movement. The recommendation of the colonial housing group was clearly shaped by previous model of imperial scientific research. Following the standard practice of imperial science, the proposed colonial housing bureau was to be attached to an existing metropolitan institution working on similar problems, in this case the, in this case, the building research station. The regional research establishment in the colonies were also to be modelled after the metropolitan establishment, although they were to play subsidiary roles. Like the case of tropical medicine in early 20th century, in which there was a division of labour between the specialised research work in the metropole and general application work in the colonies, a hierarchical division of labour was also assumed between the centre and the periphery in the proposed organisation of building research. The group proposed that regional centres deal with the simpler on-site problems and leave the more fundamental research to the metropolitan institution. This geographical division of labour in scientific research corresponded to prevailing political economic relations in which the tropical periphery was entrapped in a relationship of dependency with the temperate metropole. After several delays, the proposed Colonial Housing Bureau was established and called the Colonial Liaison Unit, with the appointment of George Anthony Atkinson as the Colonial Liaison Officer in June 1948. Each British colony was to assign a technical officer to correspond with and facilitate Atkinson's work. One of the main tasks facing Atkinson was the need to control the escalating cost of building construction in the colonies. He was asked to formulate minimum building standards and find cheaper and more efficient way of building in the tropics through the technical problem-solving approach of building science. Unlike traditional craft that depended on rules of time and practices of trial and error, building science sought to achieve predictability in performance and replicability in different sites and, and contexts. Building standards would be useless if they are not adhered to outside the building research stations where they were formulated, or if they are not adopted by people other than building scientists who formulated them. 
for standards to work, the knowledge has to be disseminated, the building industry has to be trained to follow established norms or practices, and new tools and instruments might be required. In other words, building standards need to remain constant when circulating between different sites, situations and people. In many ways, building standards approximate what Bruno Latour calls immutable mobile, an entity that is mobile, stable and combinable, in that it could circulate without distortion. Immutable mobile, however, only remains immutable and combinable inside the network. Thus, producing building standards entails network building. The work undertaken by Atkinson after his appointment was precisely that. Atkinson traveled extensively to visit the different colonial territories to make contacts, to survey and advise on colonial building developments in these places, to lecture and publicize the work undertaken in colonial building research. In addition, Atkinson also published extensively and he took on educational initiatives too, organizing courses for officials in the colonial services and teaching part-time at the Department of Tropical Studies at the, at the Architectural Association London. One of the most important part of the units and Atkinson's network building entailed assisting the establishment of regional building research stations in the colonies and beyond. Besides the, the three other stations in the Commonwealth discussed earlier, the unit also helped to establish the West African Building Research Institute in Accra in 1952 and a design and research branch within the Public Works Department in Malaya. Networks do not just permit the circulation of immutable mobiles, they have power effects too. According to Latour, spatially, a network indicates that resources are concentrated in a few places, which he called the knots and the nodes. Within the network, event places and people could be turned into immutable mobiles and circulate from one point of the network to another, often from the edges or peripheries of the network to the nodes or the centers, facilitating uh, the accumulation of knowledge at these centers. The accumulation of knowledge is also the accumulation of power because it allows a point or a few points in the network to become the centers of calculation, which can act on distant places because of its familiarity with things, people and events there. Cycles of accumulating knowledge create and reinforce an asymmetry of power between the centers and the peripheries of the network, thus allowing the centers of calculation to dominate other localities. To illustrate the power effect of network, let us turn our attention to climatic design in the tropics, a field that Atkinson was a pioneer. As we have noted earlier, the tropics was, precisely, was previously seen as an unhealthy, if not deadly, as unhealthy, if not deadly under the miasmatic theory. As germ theory gradually supplanted miasmatic theory at the turn of the 20th century, and related innovations in tropical medicines and sanitation reduced the mortality and mobility rates of Europeans in the tropics, the effect of the tropical environment on Europeans was no longer a matter of life and death. It became a much less menacing question on impinging on their thermal comfort and ability to, to labor. In a way, it's a return to the question of comfort we saw in the first moment, but um, framed in much more techno-scientific and, and sense and, and much more narrowly as well. Comfort was, of course, not merely a simple question of thermal sensation, but linked to an array of issues such as race, class, and labor. Much of the earlier research on thermal comfort was preoccupied with how it affected work efficiency among Europeans, colonial, and native laborers. This concern with labor and mental efficiency was subsequently translated into a basis for good climatic design. In a 1953 article on climatic design in the tropics, Atkinson provided an overview of the principles and design, of the principles and design prescription. Central to the article was a psychomatic chart, as you see on the screen. Plotted on the chart are the climatic data of three localities, Freetown in Sierra Leone, Kanu in Nigeria, Nairobi in Kenya, representing the principal tropical climatic types of warm and humid, hot and dry, upland, respectively. Juxtaposed onto the graph is an area that represents thermal comfort zone, the one that is colored orange. Atkinson's design prescription were in turn based on the differences between these three different climatic types and the thermal comfort zone. Such an overview of climatic design appears to achieve several things. Firstly, the complex tropics become knowable through three principal climatic types. Knowing the climate almost stands in for knowledge about the locality through the reduction, simplification, and standardization of the complex life world into a set of climatic parameters. Secondly, knowing locality through climate might strangely mean that social political, social politically diverse entities such as Freetown and Kuala Lumpur 
could be conveniently grouped together because they both share the hot and humid tropical climate. Not only could they be grouped together, but architectural responses to these socially, culturally, and politically different sites could also be conceived in a similar manner, primarily in terms of the provision of thermal comfort. Thirdly, by representing different localities according to their climatic types and, provided, and providing recommended architectural responses through immutable mobiles like tables, graphs, and diagrams, climatic design gathered distant and foreign places at one location, typically London compress their realms of reality into a flattened form that allow them to be presented at once and facilitated action at a distance on unfamiliar events, places, and people at the center of calculation. Action at a distance is manifested in at least two main forms. For British architects based in the metropole working on projects in the tropics, overview of climatic design allow them to produce tropical architecture without needing to travel to the tropics. In other words, the techno-scientific clarity and certainty of climatic design facilitated the export of British architectural expertise to the tropical colonies. The second manifestation of action at a distance was less direct, but perhaps more pervasive. Overviews of climatic design provided clear design recommendations that allowed Tropical Building Division and the Colonial Office to set building standards and establish new design norms that subsequently became known as modern tropical architecture to regulate architectural production in the colonies. The standard and norms of modern tropical architecture included specifications and planning standards, building materials and construction methods. The techno-scientific certainty and clarity that climatic design provided were especially important at a time when societies in many tropical territories were in flux, experiencing rapid social political changes and social economic transformation brought about by modernization, development, and rural urban migration. These changes including descaling and the destruction of traditional building practices. A few commentators have argued that these new design and building norms created a dependency on imported construction materials, components, and expertise from the metropole to the tropics. And finally, conclusion. I have sought to historicize tropical architecture by looking at three moments in its genealogy, a term I borrowed from Foucault. Genealogy is a history of the present, an attempt to understand how the present was historically constituted. In a way, the genealogical approach shares the general historian belief that the present carries sentimental meanings from the past. More than that, the genealogical approach is preoccupied with the insurrection of subjugated knowledges. As a way of concluding, I would like to discuss these subjugated knowledges and how their insurrections might lead us to reconceptualize architecture in the tropics. I categorize these subjugated knowledges under three broad and interconnected categories of nature, techno science, and power, echoing the subtitle of the book. At the beginning of the talk, I pointed out the taxonomic peculiarity of tropical architecture. This peculiarity can be understood in relation to what historian David Arner calls tropicality or the complex of Western ideas of historically imagining the tropics as an environmental other or authority against the perceived environmental normacy of the temperate world in Europe. Along the line of Saidian Orientalism, this environmental authority was contingent on the historical circumstances of its construction and deeply entwined with other social cultural authorities. As we have seen, the tropics was at different points constructed as the chaotic, picturesque, pestilential, uncomfortable, and or undeveloped other. Despite these entanglements between the natural and the social cultural, tropical climate was still conceived as an eternal and unchanging entity out there. Perhaps as James Roger Fleming and Vladimir Yankovic have argued, I quote, Climate is a discursive vehicle capable of naturalizing matters of social concern into matters of natural fact, end quote. The conceptual separation and distinction of climate from society is useful for two related reasons. One, for society to have recourse to climate in order to explain social phenomena. Two, for society to see climate as a problem that can be controlled and tamed. In other words, tropical climate was conceived as both authority and enemy, explanation and problem. Colonial construction of the tropics linger on in the post-colonial era, right up, right up to today. Architecturally, the hot and humid tropical climate continued to be seen as an external entity that had to be responded to or regulated in order to facilitate different forms of socio-economic development of post-colonial nations. 
But these responses are predicated on the perceived stability or immutability of tropical climate. But with anthropogenic climate change, climate is no longer stable nor predictable. Can society still have recourse to climate in view of this seismic change? Furthermore, anthropogenic climate change has also led to the formulation of Anthropocene thesis that conceive the human being as a geological agent that have irretrievably transformed nature. Among other things, the Anthropocene thesis challenges the ontological distinction between climate and society, nature and culture. Without an external nature, society-nature relationship needs to steer a new course. Instead of seeing architecture in the tropics as one that responds to tropical nature and climate, it should perhaps be one that co-produces the very tropical nature and climate it responds to. Unlike Orientalism, colonial constructions of tropical nature and climate were not just cultural construction, they were also med mediated by modern techno-science. For example, without modern meteorology, regular patterns in tropical climate could not be identified and causal relations with ill health could not be established. Building on meteorological knowledge of tropical climate, other techno-scientific knowledges such as tropical medicine and sanitation, building science and physiology, subsequently contributed to the construction of the tropics as the pestilential, uncomfortable and undeveloped other. Besides establishing the tropical climate as the root of the problem and reason for deficiencies, these fields of techno-scientific knowledge also provided remedies to address the perceived problems and deficiencies. Behind this, colonial techno-scientific knowledge and practices were of course experts like George Atkinson and institutions such as Royal Engineers and Building Research Station. After the end of colonialism in most parts of the world in the 1960s and 70s, similar techno-scientific institutions and networks continued to produce knowledge and establish norms that were central to how buildings were designed and built in the tropics. The emergence of tropical sustainable architecture in the past two decades or so was likewise dependent on new techno-scientific knowledge produced by transnational networks of sustainability institutions, experts, and consultancy firms. Techno-scientific knowledge is not just a neutral and objective knowledge describing natural phenomena out there. It's worth repeating that techno-scientific knowledge is a situated knowledge that embeds power relations and has social, cultural, and political consequences. We have seen that we have seen that different forms of techno-scientific knowledge could be accumulated and consolidated as certain nodes that we call centers of calculation. I argue that this accumulation and consolidation of knowledge was also an accrual of power because techno-scientific knowledge enabled the experts at these centers to know and act on distant places in the network. Furthermore, tropical architecture was inextricably linked to the various colonial tropical techno sciences, which were in turn shaped by the imperatives of colonial governance. Thus, the colonial techno science of building in the tropics prioritized solving certain building problems over other. It also framed building problems in manners that privileged particular types of solutions according to their political expediencies. Final slide. If the recourse to external and immutable nature has helped to render tropical architecture as seemingly apolitical, our interrogation of external and immutable nature through tropicality, techno science, and the Anthropocene suggests that tropical architecture is thoroughly political and cannot be extricated from colonial and post-colonial power relations. Moreover, our analysis draws on Foucaultian analytics of power. Specifically, we, re we deploy governmentality to discuss colonial mi military barracks. We argue that the military concepts of governmentality was translated in racialized, deficient, and excessive, and fragmented manners in the colonial tropics. Spatially, a fragmented and uneven colonial landscape was created where the colonized population live in biopolitical neglect, while the colonial population live good biopolitical lives, primarily in enclaves or spaces of exception. Similar forms of power continue to permeate the discourse and practices of sustainable architecture in the tropics today. In our age of neoliberal capitalism and splintering urbanism, the discourses and practices of tropical architecture have been fragmented into different biopolitical regimes from the exquisite villas crafted by architects for the high net worth individual to the self-built kampongs, favelas and other urban squatter settlements of marginalized community. Thank you. <laughs>